Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, where we believe there is a produce mom in all of us. I'm Lori Taylor, founder and CEO of The Produce Moms. For 10 years, I sold fresh produce to over 300 grocery stores in the U.S. And today, my team and I are fully focused on inspiring people to eat more fruits and vegetables. This show is just one of the ways that we hope to inspire you and your family to eat more produce and live a better life. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, join our community of almost 40,000 in all 50 states and over 30 countries by visiting theproducemoms.com slash subscribe. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for being here. Enjoy today's show. Welcome back, everyone. Today on the Produce Moms podcast, we are welcoming back a woman who I've been friends with for goodness, several years at this point, she has one of those magnetic personalities. The moment you meet her, you remember her forever. Her name is Stephanie Katzman. She was part of our Thanksgiving episode. She is fourth generation at S. Katzman Produce. They're a New York City-based key stakeholder in the supply chain. We're going to talk about what it means to be in a multi-generation family-owned company. I think a lot of our listeners are uh, probably would, would probably be frankly surprised at how many family owned businesses still today exist within specialty crop agriculture and our entire supply chain. And Stephanie's family is an iconic, it, it's, it's one of those iconic family owned businesses based out of New York city. And we're just so thrilled to welcome her to the show today. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm happy to be here and excited for our conversation. It's going to be great. You really are. You're, you're so natural at this. You are such a woman of passion. Uh, you bring a lot of positive energy into the industry. It's going to be a great show. Thank you. You, you really need passion to be successful in this business. And, you know, every single produce person I meet has that passion coming out of them. So it was something that I had in me, but definitely something you need in this business. And it, I've definitely grown over the years in that aspect. Yes, I agree. So tell us a little bit more about your family business. Absolutely. So our family business goes back four generations. My great grandfather started this business in the early 1900s. On the 1930s, he or started in the early 1900s uh, with a horse and wagon. Uh, so he used to go to the farm, fill up his wagon, and you know that's when his day would start and his day would end when he sold the the last bunch or the last yam out of that wagon because. You know, they, they didn't have set hours. They didn't have coolers to put stuff in. It was fill up the cart and empty it out. Uh, so his business progressed. He moved into the Bronx terminal market in the early 30s um, in downtown Manhattan. And then uh, when the market moved to the Washington Street, uh, he moved in there as well. Now, my grandfather had a fruit stand down in Florida. He uh, had a fruit stand right on the side of US-1. And in the 1930s but, or in the 1950s, um, my Great grandfather got a little bit sick and he called my grandfather up to come help him run the business. And like we do in our business, we band together for family and he closed up shop down in Florida and came up north and he started running the business out of the terminal um, in Washington Street. So then in 1967, the whole market picked up and moved uh, to Hunts Point in the Bronx where it is today. So back then we had about 20 people working for us. Uh, we sold about uh, seven different items. It was uh, collards, kale, mustards, turnip tops, uh, Hanover yams and jumbo yams. So we had just a handful of items. Now, over the years, um, our business has grown. You know, my father came into the business right, actually, even before high school. He started working here when he was 13. He told me that wow. the first job he ever had was uh, sweeping up sawdust off the floor. And he said he had to, because we used to throw down sawdust with all the water that melts with all the product that comes with ice uh, nowadays. So you'd have some water on the floor. So our job was to spread the sawdust out. It would soak it up and you'd sweep it up. So he said he did the entire floor, um, the entire warehouse. And uh, he came over to my grandfather and said, I'm done. I finished. And he looked around and said, oh, perfect. Well, there's some more over there. And he re-spread it on the floor and he had to sweep the whole thing up again. So taught, taught him right when he was young, but he loved every minute of it. Yeah. And the, the job, the work really never does end in our industry. So I'm, I'm giggling along with you at that, at just that vision. I love it. I love it. And I think you, we really, really saw some major growth come as we started to expand our product line. So okay, yeah. in, um, in 1995, we went into the berry business so we've expanded our veg department as well. We added some other items in there, but we expanded out to include berries. And then in 2000, in 
2004, we added our fruit department. And then in 2005, we added a specialty department. So we went from seven items and about 20 people working for us. And today we have about 375 people. Um, mm -hmm. We have over 2,000 different items, um, full line of all fruits and vegetables. You, you name it, we sell it. And probably yeah. in 10 different pack sizes, shapes, and colors. Uh, so just just seeing that growth over the years and seeing the way the business has changed has been awesome. And really, when you think about it, like 19, you said that, that was 1995 when you started the expansion with the berries. Yeah. That's really not that long ago, Stephanie. It isn't. And it's been so cool to see the progression over the last you know 120 years of our business. And then if you really drill into the last 30 years and then right. you go to the last 20 and you're seeing that the change is happening faster. And I really attribute that to not just the people, but our industry and where we are in our industry. So yeah, that's so true. Because I mean, 1995, I was, I was um, in high school and even the grocery shopping experience as a consumer back then, much different than what it is today. You know, you, we still, there were still parts of the country where probably berries weren't even on shelf year round, you know, that. Absolutely. And that, they were sold in the open baskets. Right. I mean, right. If, you, if you think back before, I know a lot of the clamshells came about from some of the food safety regulations and everything. But I mean, even when I when I started back in the business, you know, I, I came in and I worked summers throughout uh, college. Um, mm -hmm. So that's about 20 years ago now. And I was I, I was selling berries. And when I was in there selling berries, it was all the pints. I mean, the, the flats. Pints was, yeah. Yeah, flats yeah. Open, yeah. It was 12 open green basket pints that came came in each box. And, you know, they even came wired together. So you almost had to buy two boxes at a time. But uh, the, the products <laughs> has changed. Yeah. It, I mean, in, in a very positive way. Um, but yeah, it's just so fascinating. So when you talk to people that have a stakehold, like what you and your family have, Stephanie, it's really evident how our industry has evolved and also how the supply chain has really framed up the consumer experience. Like think about how at-home dining or even restaurant dining has changed in those 30 years that Katzman can really look back and be like, that was massive growth for us, like rapid, massive growth. I feel like the same advancements have happened in the way we all experience food. Absolutely. And I think you, it's not even just like how, how we're experiencing food. I think it's even also, you know, the, how we're thinking about food. So I think way back when it was really a a source of fuel almost. It was a family dinner. People would come around the table. Um, yeah. Yes, we, it would be more like a meeting point. And then I think as we got into more of a fast paced lifestyle, you have a lot more of uh, two parents in the home working. So you didn't yeah. have that, you know, old fashioned kind of come home dinner being prepared. So you had a lot more on the go, people eating late, later dinners, trying new things. And I think those wants and needs of the customers is what created some of these different value added packaging. Um, you know, some pre-cut product, some of these businesses that have developed like your, you know, your Blue Aprons, your HelloFresh, those delivery services yeah. that come with all the prep done for you. So it's really figuring out what your customers want and being able to adapt. And if you think about it, that's what our growth has been over the last right. you know, 20, 20, 30 years too. It's figuring out as the customer's needs change, as the customer's needs change, being able to adapt and fulfill those needs because you don't want to keep telling them, hey, no, do things the way we're going to do them. We want to be progressive. You know, we want to go out there and find the next best way to do it. Or mm -hmm. we added a, a trucking company onto our business back in 2000 and, um, 2004. And mm -hmm. we started doing deliveries for our customers free of charge. Why? Because a lot of our customers either didn't have the truck, they were trying to, um, they had to man the store. So we have a lot of smaller supermarkets in the New York area. So a lot of them do everything. So you'll have a store owner who would come here at night, shop for his store, drive his truck around, pick up his order, go back to his store, stock his shelf. And then he'd man the register all morning in the store because he didn't have enough employees. So being able to say, you know what, I'll deliver it to your store and being able to save him that trip. And, you know, an extra dollar or two in the grand scheme of things wouldn't make a difference for him because we're saving him that time. And sometimes time can be invaluable when you're running a business. Or sleep. Yes. <laughs> what's, what, what's sleep? I've never heard that word in the produce industry. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of, you know, what you're describing there, I'm like, ah, oh, that's so New York city. I miss it by the way. I can't wait to come back. Um, 
but I mean, I've been to, I've been to your offices, Stephanie. I think I've actually sat in that exact chair you're sitting in right wow. now when you weren't in the office and I was, I was like, I sent you a selfie, but, um, <laughs> I, so I've been to the, I've been to S Katzman produce in the Bronx. Um, I've seen the scale of the operation. I've seen, um, the prestige and the leadership that you have there at the Hunts Point Market. And I would love to get your perspective as one of the largest operators serving the New York City area. How, how are you doing? How did you handle the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? I mean, obviously we're, it, it's still happening. Um, tell us more about how things changed in your world in March, 2020 to date. So I'd say the biggest thing that we took out of it um, is that our proof point of being a wholesaler distributor and being able to adapt to whatever our customers' needs are was really proven. And that's really what our business model is around. You know, even COVID aside, just being able to adjust as our customers need things, whether they have, you know, problems with their delivery, they need a last minute fill-in, whether it's a new item starting in a new area that they haven't been able to get to whether it's a new product that they haven't even heard of or needing to consolidate and move things around because they had trucking issues, whatever it is, our job as a wholesaler distributor is to be here to support our customers and being able to adapt as we need them. And it goes the same for our shippers as well. So when our, you know, you can't really control mother nature. So if the weather is beautiful, you're going to have tons of production and we're going to need to be able to adjust for our shippers too because we need to be able to support them because they can only control so much of what they grow. And after that, it's, you know, not really up to them. So being able to adapt is key. So what we found when we, you know, were faced with the struggles around COVID was being able to adapt was key there as well. So that was, you know, immediately reacting, following all the CDC guidelines and recommendations, getting safety communication out there to all employees, making sure we were able to provide them with protective equipment. So masks, gloves, uh, we immediately put on two additional cleaning crews because we're a 24-hour, six-and-a-half-day-a-week sure. operation. So, you know, we have a cleaning crew that usually comes through once a day, but that wasn't going to be enough. So we put on two additional ones. So three times a day, we were having spots that were being hit. The wow. tie, high touch areas were hitting even more than that. But it, it was really kind of jumping into it, staying ahead of it, and just communicating and being open with our team and really focusing on doing everything we could to be as safe as possible. Because it wasn't just our employees. It was definitely, you know, taking care of our customers and taking care of our vendors too. And then the next next aspect of it was really taking care of the community. So yeah. we do a lot of um, work in our, in our community with children and with schools. Uh, it's a, you know, a, a high touch point for us. It shouldn't be something that you really have to explain to people while you're into, but we're a firm believer in making a difference with children. Why? Children can't help themselves. So being able to help others who can't help themselves mm -hmm. and getting to them while they're young. If you can instill these good habits and good behaviors in them when they're young, you're going to create, you know, healthy people when they're older. And you're going to create people who have a taste for these fruits and vegetables. So being able to get to them is very important. So being able to yeah. take care of our employees and our staff and still being able to work with the philanthropic organizations that we deal with out in the community, being able to you know, we do, we do food donations to schools that we work with. One of the great ones is a dream. So mm -hmm. they run a charter school up in East Harlem. Um, they're opening up a school in the Bronx. They work with um, some of the public schools and run after school programs there. And we've done a weekly produce donation with them for, for years now. And, you know, I almost made a game of it because they don't have a lot of exposure to all these fruits and vegetables. And some of them haven't heard of a lot of the products we sell. So whether it's, you know, trying to send them a new item that they've never tasted before. Uh, when we sent the, them lychee nuts for the first time, I had to send it with like a little instructional video on how to open it. Yeah. And sometimes it's something in the produce industry we take for granted that we're just exposed to all these different things. But, you know, a lot of these food deserts or low income areas um, like the Bronx where we're located is, is they just don't have the access to it. So being able to provide that not just the produce to them, but the education about it and why it's important um, was something that we lost um, because they shut the schools down during COVID. Mm, so yeah. we were able to work with them and my hat is off to dream because they were able to coordinate something that they don't do. So for us, we're used to having to pivot and take care of things, but for them, it was different. So within a couple of weeks, they had an entire distribution program set up 
um, in the schools and we were donating um, you know, pallets of, of produce to them on a weekly basis. And we ended up being able to roll it out in um, East Harlem and in the Bronx. And they were having the families of the children um, come and pick up bags of produce for the week and bring home all fresh fruits and vegetables. So we started that, we got it going up in early April and we were able to continue it all throughout COVID and through the end of this year. And we actually just had um, you know, a meeting with them last month, the program went so well and they were able to reach so many people and the feedback they were getting from the families and just, you know, they, they were having people come to them and saying, you know, as bad as this is, you know, I'm eating healthier at home, I'm feeling better. And we were able to see this. Yeah. We actually just um, decided to continue the program with them next year. And we're going to start up our school donations back to the uh, the weekly donations of the Taste the New Fruit. But uh, we're going to be able to keep this uh, weekly donations for the families to take fruit home um, through the end of the year. So or through the end of next year. And we're so excited about that because just, you know, like I said, the more you can get to children when they're young and you can just get them liking these things, the sooner they're going to grab an apple off the shelf instead of a bag of potato chips. So, yep, for sure. That is a beautiful story. So much important. I wrote down as you were talking about the food access, uh, food deserts, food access. It's a, it's a chronic issue throughout the entire United States. It correlates with, um, you know, low poverty areas are more likely to be, uh, in food deserts. And one thing though, as I, as the paradox almost is uh, food is culture. It is everyone, you know, it doesn't matter what socioeconomic status, what type of food access you have. Every single person is united by food. And the other thing, Stephanie, that always inspires me is how around the world it's fresh produce. That is the universal food that is, that is consumed and part of every single culture in every single nook and cranny of this globe. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't it be if you think about it? Right. I mean, what, what, what else is there where you can say it's good for you? It tastes good. Mm -hmm. It looks good. I mean, it's a great affordable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really a great, great industry. And and, and it's not boring either. I mean, Mm -hmm. think about it. There's with all the different fruits and vegetables that exist out there, there's still new products coming out every day. There's still new varieties of old products coming out every day. Right. Um, There's still new packaging that's coming out. There's still things that, you know, science behind creating extending shelf life. So I think our, our industry is very, very exciting in that aspect too. It's not just, oh, fruits and vegetables. I mean, granted, I'm a little bit biased, but I don't think there's too much exciting stuff out there about meat and chicken and dairy. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, what, what else is there? But produce you can get into, you can, you know, talk about, think about all the crazy videos we see out there, people cutting and designing produce differently. I mean, it's just right. fun the colors, the, the flavor profiles, the textures, it's just, it's never ending. I agree with you. Um, okay. So we're on the, one of my favorite topics, food is culture and this, and, and the way that it brings people around, uh, the kitchen table, it's like the heart of the home, you know? So you mentioned previously in your remarks, more people are cooking at home. Um, people, some people are eating healthier than they ever have. So what are some of your favorite products in the warehouse right now that you want home cooks to be aware of? So one of the neatest things I think about right now is all the new products that are out there. So, you know, one of the, one of the things that we found that came out of COVID is it kind of hyper, you know, brought into hyper speed, the, this change into wanting to cook with some of these new items. So you had stuff like turmeric root or mm-hmm. shishito peppers where maybe five years ago, you didn't see them anywhere except for food service. You've seen items like that starting to creep into retail. And then you're also seeing new new packaging coming out. And I think more access to recipes online and the social media aspect, just bringing more things to light on what you can try and do at home has been very exciting. So for me, it's not one particular item. It's the concept of going out there and looking for the new item you've never seen before and um, you know, something you've only seen in restaurants or only tried here, or maybe even something you haven't tasted and bringing it home, checking it out on the internet. If it doesn't have a label that explains to you what you should do with it, although most stuff does now right. and being able to try new things with that. You know, we, um, we got to, we, t- we worked a lot with our shippers. Um, one of the things as a wholesaler that we do besides moving produce back and forth to the supply chain is we move information back and forth too. 
So being able to talk to some of our shippers, especially the ones who are a lot more food service focused that are now looking for a different outlet for their products and finding out from our customers what items they're looking for um, on the shelves now and saying, hey, I know you used to sell this to food service, but let's figure out a different type of pack size to go right. with and let's see if we can work it into the retail level. I mean, for us, we, you know, we buy and sell other people's brands, but we work with a lot of our shippers and we we have our own brand, Bloom Fresh, that we mm-hmm. use just to package some retail products. And it's, hey, this is a great item. We've been working with this grower for a while. We work it into most of our food service customers. Let's test it out at the retail level because the home shopper isn't scared to try these new things anymore. And we have um, we have our first dried product that we're launching out there. It's a dried pomegranate oil. So it's Ooh. a new, yeah, so just the center of the pomegranate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we use a slow drying process. So it really holds the flesh of the product on there. It keeps the flavor and the nutritional factor, which is big in pomegranates, all there for you. So not only is it a new unique item, but now we're putting it in a dried, you know, dried form. So it's still that fresh fruits and vegetable flavor and nutritional value for you, but it's something new. So you can, you can bake with it. You can eat it as a snack, you throw it as salad, ice cream, just all the different things you can try with produce. I, um, I think it's you. neat how you combine it now. I agree. So it, I'm, I'm here and try them all, find your favorite. That's a tagline we've said many times at the produce moms. Uh, but I'm also, I'm also hearing a lot of excitement for the dried pomegranate arils. Definitely on board with that. I've had a chance to try dried pomegranate arils or dried pomegranate seeds. And oh my goodness, what a treat. I love them. So best of luck with you all as you expand that product line. Um, and I would I will say, you know, we just published a blog 21 must try produce department items in 2021. So we do it every year. And last year, obviously it was 20 items to try in 2020. This year it's 21 items to try in 2021. Um, I can't, it's hard to, to pick like what is the item to try. I think one that's worthy of a call out, you mentioned a variety, mushrooms. I, I, I anticipate that 2021 will be a year where mushroom sales continue to just through the roof skyrocket as people are embracing, you know, more plant forward lifestyle and trying to incorporate more fruits and vegetables, the meaty texture of mushrooms and that umami flavor that we all love is, is a great, is a great way to, to add that. And, and one of the only natural sources of vitamin D in your mushrooms. So, um, Really exciting stuff. You can check out that blog for some of our other inspirations at the Produce Mom. Stephanie, oh my goodness, I have enjoyed this episode. I've enjoyed listening to you talk about your family history. Um, it brings a whole new light and meaning to that wonderful day that I had in the Bronx visiting your, your family business. Um, truly, thank you so much for sharing the heritage and the history with us all today on the show. But like all episodes, you get the final word. So anything that you'd like to say in closing and from me and everyone at TPM, thank you for being here and thanks for all that you do. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. I've uh, enjoyed our conversations. Always enjoy talking to you. Um, thank this you. one has been great. Uh, I just want to, my last word out there to everyone is really to think about what it is you could do to really make a difference out there. So introducing healthy foods to children when they're young and creating those good behaviors and those healthy healthy children now are gonna result in a brighter future for them. So getting out there and talking to, whether it be your local food banks or different organizations in the area, or even some of the schools that you can partner up with and just getting out there and reaching the kids because they always need our help. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Produce Moms podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a featured guest, just send an email to Lori at theproducemoms.com. We know there is a Produce Mom in you because there's a Produce Mom in all of us. Join our community on Facebook and all social platforms. Help us change the way America eats. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.